my little moment of enjoyment where I get out and come and talk to people about what used to be my old job, which so I used to work in the Faculty of Theology, and I've always had a particular interest in the theological dimension of my subject and indeed many other things as well. Uh, Unfortunately tonight I can't give you a presentation that has the immediacy of time uh, that uh, uh, Philip has done. Though I would say I like to think that when I'm in an environment like this that we all realise that all these times are connected in a way anyway and uh, there is much to learn in any particular era. I will say before I begin however that no challenge in the modern world is greater for us I think than the challenge of how to manage the environment and how to protect the environment. And I fully concur with what you say, but I think it's in many ways one of the uh, tasks in which theologians have a very different role to play, because uh, what, what we are doing is not against science, it's with science, but it has dimensions that are complementary and additional to science. And uh, in a way, if you go back and think about it in all the areas, the way in which Encountered nature and thought about nature and seen symbols and signs in nature as well, seen reflected in nature, you know, all the other aspects of the world, including ourselves. You know, that is really such a fundamental part of our, our journey through that knowledge and also you know, to save the earth very much. Okay, now uh, my task, which uh, I gave you to do, was talk about saints and nature and uh, in the Celtic tradition and really being sort of tracking or uh, other things. What can I say about saints and nature uh, in the Celtic uh, tradition? And what I'm going to do before I begin is tell you the when and the where. Okay? Because if we're going to have meaning in any reflection upon theology and nature, we need to think about not only what it means in a sort of universal sense, but also what Encounter in time and place, and from that comes much universal symbolism. There's also a specific context. I'm glad to start with boats. I spend quite a lot of time when I can on boats. And a few years ago, I had a particular pleasure, which is to in going to look at where the Celtic fathers particularly had their main desert, for want of a better word, had their main theatre of activity, which is out in the North Atlantic. I was very privileged to be asked to go on a voyage on a yacht with a group of Irish people, uh, writers, musicians, a uh, mountain climber, you know, a good, good crew if you want to reflect upon, well, you know, the sense of awe in the face of nature, good to have a poet with you, excellent to have a musician, uh, mountain climber, you may not have a solitude in high places, you know, so it's good thing. And with this, definitely. What the crew was including me, with the grand title of visiting professor. We went on this relatively small craft, about 40 feet long, out into the uh, ocean, North Atlantic, trying to find out some of the places in which the, uh, the Celtic fathers were known as Papa, or in Latin word, Papa fathers, but they were often particularly called the Papa, or the Norse to the North Atlantic, to designate that these were the sort of desert fathers of the North. We looked for all the place names where these sites are supposed to, the pattern names are supposed to show where they've been. We also went to places where in various Latin texts we know the Irish settlers have gone. And that experience of being on a boat, of course, gives you the ability to reenact, of course, to the theological idea, to reenact that sense of community, that sense of forming a group of people surrounded by just the fragile shell of the boat. Travelling through the deep ocean, surrounded by, well, a sailing boat, luckily, creatures of the ocean, that sense of imminent nature, a little bit of sense of danger occasionally with bad weather. They weren't going to run anything in the dark because there is no night up there in the summer, but you know, the, the sense of really that, that was what the encounter with nature in the early church often was, which was the travelling of a small community through the wilderness. It was a great experience, but it brings me back to that sense that it's often when you get into that closed environment, you look out upon nature, you really appreciate, you know, that sense of how people have, have gone to live in the wilderness, want to think about the wilderness, and counter that in the ascetic tradition. So that's, to some extent, I've chosen three texts 
two of which pretty much speak to that thing. What are my texts? Okay, well, I have. Two texts will be my key ones. The Life of St. Columba of Iona by Adam Moore. Now, this is a text written on the island of Iona, a place I should say the love of the British Orthodox pilgrimage seems to go there all the time. Uh, Iona is a, an island monastery off the western coast of Scotland. It was founded uh, in the 500s uh, AD, founded uh, by uh, St. Columba, who went there in 560. He was an Irishman from the north of Ireland, and his mission, you might say, was one, as often was the case in the early Celtic tradition, was one of going out to leave his fatherland, to leave his family, to take up the cross and follow Christ, in the tradition that's often known as peregrinatio uh, in Celtic tradition, uh, making yourself into an exile for God, going out into the wilderness. But he arrived there also and found himself in a position where he was his task to also bring Christianity to the Picts, an unconverted people in the north of Britain and Scotland, and encounters with nature in that life are one of the things I want to look at. The other major text I want to look at is another Latin text called the Navigatio Sancta Brendami Abatus, or the Voyage of St. Brendan the Abbot. Now, St. Brendan is a saint very well known for his travels, and he was a contemporary of St. Columba, he died in 575. The life of Columba, on the one hand, is a typical biography, uh, a typical saint's life. Lots of episodes, not actually in chronological order, they're actually thematic in the organisation. Parables of saints, encounters, and various things. And also, uh, the other, um, the other Navigatio Santa Maria Vargas, is actually uh, something closer to a romance. Uh, it's a, a narrative more like you know, a novel in a way, it's a, it's a, a rolling narrative with grand themes in the background, but in the foreground, the journey of Brendan and his crew in a small boat, encountering God's wonders upon the ocean. Stories about the encounter that uh, St. Columba has with a boar. We all know that from the start of the train, you know what I mean. But, uh, I mean, the name is a piggy type in this case. <laughs> but uh, on one occasion, they're told the blessed man was staying some days in the Isle of Skye. You don't have to read all this stuff, I just think I so that's the main story. And he left the brethren and went alone a little farther than usual to pray. And having entered a dense forest, he met a huge wild boar. I can't think I should tell about a nursery story like play school or something. A huge wild boar. It happened to be pursued by hounds. As soon as the saints saw him at some distance, he stood looking intently at him. Then raising his holy hand and invoking the name of God in fervent prayer, he said to it, Thou shalt proceed no further in this direction. Perish in the spot which thou hast now reached. That the sound of his words of the saint of the woods, the terrible brute, was not only unable to see farther, but by the efficacy of his word, immediately fell dead before Columbus's face. Not a good start, really, is it? I've got to kill him off a piece of nature here in the first episode. <laughs> but balls are actually a really common uh, image in Saints of Life's and Celtic world. Sometimes they play a role, that particular, sometimes they play a role particularly of mediating between the wild spaces and the settled places. You know anything about the behaviour of pigs, having lived many years in the country, and you know, all my family, this seems to be really familiar. Pigs, of course, move both between you know, grazing on the flat and also grazing on the edge of the woods. So they, they inhabit, if you like, both uh, the plain and the forest. They also have a liminal existence in a way. They can be on the edge of both on both environments. And in a way, they can act as a mediating force. In this case, Columbia himself has gone slightly into the woods. He has crossed over slightly into the wild places. He encounters the war in that place. But of course, one of the things about Columbia is that as a saint, he can travel into these wild places, and by just the command of the word, he can command nature in this wild environment. Forest as a symbol of the boundary between the second world and the unchristianized hinterland. Symbolic of a world, of course, in the early church in which not everywhere is known yet. There is both the known and the unknown. There's the human era and there's the sort of wild place out there. So it's a different role of peace as well. 
We have in the Welsh tradition, uh, another Celtic language, but in this case Latin again, the actual wife in question. Why does the candle claim carvan as a mouthful, so ten times faster than the candle claim carvan in my cliffus? Like fear in the throat there. The life of Cadog, there's a story that when Cadog was wandering around looking for a place to found his monastery, all he could find was a valley in the swamp at the bottom. There often was valleys and swamps at the bottom when you found a monastery. So it's supposed to live in a way it's this a fertile and wild place. Uh, the wildness of the monastic site and retaining of that site with the monastic settlement, a very important image uh, in Western monastic foundation tradition. Um, and one of these happens with uh, Clifford's story with Cadol. Cadol uh, goes to look for where to settle and he goes to sleep at night. He says to his men, look, you know, there's a wild boar down there. And we go in the morning, the boar will show us where to build our monastery. And the boar takes them and points at different spots and they build a refectory here and the chapel there. And the boar becomes, in a way, you know, the agent of God in directing them to where is the appropriate place to settle, which gives you the idea in a way that nature is both uh, a challenge to the saint, but also nature um, serves God in, in many ways to be so, provide signs to the saint as well, signifies in different actions. Now, with a lot of these things, of course, there's a long tradition. In fact, boars pointing to where you found things are also found, for example, in the Latin tradition, maybe also in the Greek tradition, but certainly, for example, in Virgil's Aeneid, there's a story of you know, a boar that tells uh, Aeneas where. City. So these things are also a classical tradition as well. Another occasion, St. Columbia, we're back to St. Columbia now, we're in Scotland. He's up in the north now, okay, right up in the north, in Inverness or near Inverness. One called Loch Ness, you know what Loch Ness is, that big valley up in the middle of Scotland. And it says, on another occasion, these some of these wives often say, that on another occasion, on another occasion, and then again on another occasion, often out of the water. And the blessed man was living for some days in the province of the pigs. He was obliged to cross the river Nessa, that's where it is. And when he reached the bank of the river, he saw some of the inhabitants buried an unfortunate man. And according to the account of those who were buried him, it was a short time before sea that he was swimming and bitten most severely by a monster that lived in the water. The wretched body was, though too late, taken out with a hook by those who came to his assistance in the boat. So that jaws and noise in the The blessed man, on hearing this, was so far from being dismayed that he directed one of his companions to swim and row her across to the cobble that was moored at the part of the bank. This is a lot of faith in the saint here. You know, he's basically saying, look, you know, someone's been bitten to death in the river there, but look, I'm telling you, don't pay any attention to that. You're just going to swim in the river and go and get that boat for me. You know, because they trust the saint. And Luton, one of his followers, hearing the command of the excellent man, obeyed without the least delay, taking all his clothes except his tunic and leaping into the water. But the monster, which had been so far from satiated, was only roused from the prey, was lying along the stream. When it felt the water disturbed about by the man swimming, rushed out and did an awful roar, darted out him with his mouth wide open as the man swam in the middle of the stream. The blessed man observed his role as grace to hold hand, but all the rest of the brethren as well as strangers were stupefied with terror, and invoking the name of God said, Thou shalt not go no further, nor touch the man, go back with all speed. The voice of the saint, the monster was terrified, and fled more quickly than if it had been pulled back with the ropes. When I was an undergraduate, I was set for my first essay at university. This is 36 years ago now sitting in the University of Sydney Library back then, and reading the life of St. Columbus on a very cold, wet May day. There's a message about the environment. Very cold, wet out there now. It was freezing in May in those days. That's what's changed. And I had this book in front of me, and I copied out this miracle very, you know, diligently, and I wrote in the essay about miracles in the life of St. Columbus. And my examiner wrote in the margin, guess who at this point? Can you guess what she was talking about? It took me three weeks. A lot of this monster, there, of course. <laughs> and this is the uh, this is the point where uh, Saint Columba lived in Scotland, set to the west of Scotland. And from here, if my map is still on this PowerPoint, I hope it is. Um, the uh, is near the end of the Great Glen, the bottom end of the Great Glen, which leads you up past Loch Ness to Inverness at the top. And this is the spot from which uh, many of the enterprise 
rises of the uh, Celtic fathers living in, uh, in Scotland is the base from which people went both eastward into the wild lands of islands with the unconverted north, but also as we can see westward into the ocean. And this monastery is a hub of that. You can see if you're interested in the uh, I've got a mouse here I can use the point. Around right here, this is the enclosure of the monastery, the valleys that we call the gate and the ditch that surrounds it. Uh, and in here is where St. Columba lived and is buried, though we don't quite know where he was buried, just in that area there. And I own a Jacob's famous ecumenical community where people go on retreats. Uh, and also, if you're interested in Australian history, Governor Corrie is buried just over there somewhere as well. And he was a native of the Isle of Mull, so it's near there. Uh, but, uh, what we see in these episodes is the saint going out into the wild spaces. Because when he goes to meet the unconverted king of the Picts, nature provides him with the opportunity also to demonstrate miracles, uh, to show his command, and God's command, it was by him, as it sounds good, God's command over nature. And this wilderness is where it's going to take place. So this is the place we're talking about. Iona is out in the west there. On the Isle of Mull, which on this picture sadly I can draw on, but you know, one does these things. It's the Inverness is there, but up the other end of the Great Glen. We'll come to the Orkneys in a moment, which is the scene of another couple of interesting episodes. Now, what we see in these episodes is a few different things. We see different examples in those two episodes where the saint is able to demonstrate the power of his word to command nature, on the one hand, to kill the bulldog threatens uh, uh, him. On another occasion, to simply still and dispel the beast of the sea. There is a narrative behind that. I think the beast that lives on the edge of the sea is a beast of the sea. The beasts of the sea, of course, have this very apocalyptic overtone. Because they have that apocalyptic overtone, they're not going to die just yet. They're going to wait for later events. So they simply get sent back to the ocean to do the beast things that the beast do in the ocean. Another time, a soldier of Christ named Cormac had gone far, has gone far from the land over the boundless ocean for sail. The St. Columba, who was then staying beyond the dorsal reach of Britain, recommended him in the following terms to King Groot. King Groot is the guy he needs in the next in the peace. Is that some of our brethren who lately set sail are anxious to discover a desert in the path of the sea? So, you see, the word they use, some they use desertum, the Latin word, some of they use heremon, the word taken. Greek. Interesting, they always, in this text, it's always with breathing, so it's always harem and not harem, which is interesting. So it's just, there's a sort of desire to show their Greek credentials occasionally in this text, even in the 6th century Scotland. But also, in a way, those two things are seen as, as uh, synonymous, that to be that you live in a desert is to be in a hermitage in a way as well, uh, which is, of course, the Western the Latin take upon heremos. Uh, and it says, some of them set sail and are anxious to discover a desert in the path of the sea. Should they happen after many wanderings to come to the Orcadian Islands, do you care to instruct this chief, whose hostages are in your hand, that no evil will befall them within his dominions? So sure enough, Cormac turns up in the Orkneys, and the fact that the saint has intervened on his behalf has caused him not to be put to death by the fine king of the Orkneys. He must have lots of what to do with nature. I'll come to that. But what's interesting about this is also the way that these stories are constructed, because the saint has to have the opportunity to show he wields both temporal power and spiritual power. So he's also a guy who, you know, doesn't always have to pull out the spiritual ammunition. He can also use his influence because he's a powerful person. Okay, so these are just opposed to liberty. And then after the lapse of a few months, while the saint has remained now in the Ionan Island, so he's gone back home, Cormac's name is mentioned one day unexpectedly in his presence by some persons in conversation. Observing it's not yet known whether the voyage of Cormac had been successful or otherwise. And then he said, Well, you'll see Cormac, about whom you are now speaking, arrive here today. So it was him. still its opportunity to do the supernatural stuff. It's a terrible commentary on our age in this next sentence where it says, And after about an hour, one of which were late, I read that as LOL and not LO exclamation. No, 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 no. They're all susceptible. Then we come immediately to another story, and he nature sort of shows its hand. Cormac was then engaged again in a voyage in the ocean. But he sailed 14 days in summer and as many nights, his vessel sailed with full sails from the south wind 
in a straight course from the land into the northern regions. And remember in these northern regions in the 6th century, nobody has a clue what's up here. This is in a way for the northern boundary of the world what the, uh, the areas around the equator are in the south, in the unknown and uncrossable. And in a way these desert fathers in the north are living up towards that boundary in a way that the desert fathers are Egypt moving down towards the other one. They see themselves as living in the edge of the world. And at the edge of the world, weird things happen. The tenth hour of the fourteenth day, certain dangers of the most formidable and insurmountable kind presented themselves. A multitude of loathsome and annoying insects, such as never been seen before, except in the northern beaches on Saturday night, covered the sea in swarms and struck the keel and sides the crowd of sperm of vessels so very violently that it seemed as if they would wholly penetrate the leather and covering of the ship. According to the accounts afterwards given by those who were there, they were about the size of frogs. They could swim but were not able to fly, and their sting was extremely painful. And they crowded upon the handles of the oars. Now, what's about these sort of stories is when they start to get into real detail, you know something theological is going on. You know, they start to get down to the nitty gritty of the little bits and pieces of the boat. Symbolism is very important. We are in the very far north, we're at the edge of the known world. And the boundary between our world and the other world up here is, is made up in a way of things that are different, things that are challenging. And one of these is the sea is solid. Well, in classical tradition, the sea is solid up there, but it's usually not animated, it's usually inanimate, it's coagulated, or the sky comes down to meet the sea, or whatever description of pack ice you want. But these are animals. And people got very carried away and say, ah, there's big mosquitoes, or they're stinging jellyfish. Well, they're not, they're demonic beasts. But they represent, of course, like all things in saints' lives, they're a metaphor for something in nature. But they gain, of course, in diabolical elements as well. But here, let's deal with some very, shall we say, pregnant motifs here. The ship is covered in leather. It's not just the old material. You remember the desert fathers. The desert fathers wrapped themselves in capes of leather. They put leather belts around their waists, as monks are still going to do today. What for? Because, of course, that leather is the mortal flesh. And we're travelling in a garment of mortal flesh, and that garment of mortal flesh reminds us, of course, of our mortality of our body, but not necessarily of our soul, and also reminds us, in a sense, that we are symbolically yeah, wrapped in, wrapped in, in the, the carnal world, if you like. When you get beasties to come along and poke holes in it, well, you know, psychologists go in all sorts of directions there, but there is this idea that that threatening to pierce the eye is taking away the prophylactic that lies between you and the perilous sea. And this is a theme that just gets developed all the time in the Celtic tradition of logic and the ocean. In some ways, the, the wrapping in, in, in the high is being like in the beast of the whale, it's, you know, the symbolism of being sort of inside in nature. There's also symbolism, uh, some saints go on the ocean in boats without eyes, which I think is meant to I mean, we understand means they go out and skeleton the boat. But of course, you know, God's power is such that the water may be excluded, you know, as an act of the, the most faith. Now, I'm not saying anyone did this, but you know, this is the literature. Very powerful imagery here and Cormac and his fellow voyagers pray to St. Columba, and at that same hour, Columba, though far away in body, is present in spirit with Cormac in the ship. So even though he's back in my own, that prayer brings him into this environment and he's able to uh, dispel uh, these beasts and create a wind that would blow him back out of the north. But note the line, Brethren, pray with all your usual further Cormac, who by sailing too far has passed the bounds of human enterprise exposed at this moment to dreadful alarm and fright in the presence of monsters which were never seen before and are almost indescribable. This uh, idea in a way that there is something you can go too far, you can go too far beyond the bounds of nature. As I spoke south wind seas and the north wind blew, that's what saints are for. In one of the earliest Irish commentaries on the Mark, actually the earliest Western commentary on the Mark as far as I know, by a man that usually sort of comes in interesting title of pseudo Jeremy, because he's a Jeremy, but he's you know, someone who thinks he is. Uh, there's a commentary on Mark 4.38, which gives you another take upon this motif. 
about and Christ is steering in the ship on the Sea of Galilee, uh, but he's asleep, of course. You know. The ship is made of dead skins containing living beings. It holds off the waves and is strengthened with wood. This is how the church is saved by the cross and death of the Lord. The cushion represents the body of the Lord, on which the living things are bound down like the head. The ship is the church at its beginning, and Jesus leaves in the body of his sins because he never sleeps in the eyes of Israel. So the bits of the ship then have their importance. The hide covering of the ship, this is how the tradition is to build these boats, the monks use the rocks hide over them, is the image of mortality, but of course the wooden frame when it comes to the room, it comes to the cross, that gives force, gives strength, protects that ship, that is Christ holding the ship together. So, you know, colourful imagery there, but also, of course, making that point that we are travelling through the what the late Roman writer called the monster filled ocean in the hide of the beast. So, strong symbols in there. This is developed very strongly in the next episode. So, to put it on these things, the, 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 these episodes emphasize that the world they live in has a boundary between the wild and the settled world. The saints move between this, uh, but they have this perilous relationship with nature. But Columbia, in this case, has the power over nature. Of um, these creatures. Two different story. This one comes from the Voyage of St. Brendan. And again, we have this idea the Voyage of St. Brendan is about a monk called St. Brendan who is supposed to have travelled out into the Western Ocean around about the 6th century, the late 5th century, the 6th century. And in this journey, he travels around a series of islands in the ocean on the way to a place called Promised Land of the Saints. The Promised Land of the Saints is a, uh, a reflex of the biblical uh, Promised Land and a reflex of the New Jerusalem. It is the creation within the uh, sort of imagery of Exodus of the idea that we are travelling in the desert as monks en route to the Promised Land, like the Israelites are going to the Promised Land. The Promised Land in this case is the New Jerusalem. And in this, uh, on the way to this Promised Land, well, the Promised Land is supposed to be a land which the saints will live in the last days, where the people there resurrected uh, during the last millennium and they will live there. Uh, and it's shown to various people who go into the ocean. It's an island in the ocean. And it creates the idea that is very strong in the theological tradition of the Irish, that they are people who live on the edge of the ocean, and the ocean is the edge of the world. When you go out there, you're trapped in both time and space. I suppose you could say it's a cosmic theology in our terms. It is the going to the edge and it's the uncertainty of the edge. So in the way we regard the edge of the universe, they regard the edge of their own ocean. Because they don't know what lies beyond the even if the world is round. You know, so it's stopped there, there are all sorts of possibilities of how it was round and how things on the outer edge are related to them. They go into this place and they travel through this environment, island after island after island. And in many of these islands, they encounter aspects of nature, creatures, uh, physical things. And these are all of them things with a, both a, an enjoyment, you might say, of the exoticism of the nature they have discovered in the ocean. Because though this story is quite a fantastic and a theological narrative, it does build upon the idea that these are stories that came back from monks who have visited islands in the ocean. And some of them you can see behind them that moment of awe in the face of things that are inexplicable. And instead of simply not explaining them, often you turn them into a narrative and you interpret and make a parable out of it. Now, I'll just start with one story that shows the typical relationship again of nature and saints in this tradition. So, Brandon comes to an island, and this island, it turns out, takes him some days to get on shore. When they go on shore, they go up to a citadel. Town and says here they go, so you know, seven. And in this place there is a hall, and it's furnished with beds and chairs and food and water. There's no one there. And it's hanging around the edges of it are metal objects. And it says bridles in Latin, but necklaces would be also a possible translation. But I think we're meant to understand, even though it seems like a secular place, it's really the house of God. It's God's house, it's empty, waiting for them to arrive. God is present but not visible. And the things hanging around the walls are metaphors for the church and vessels, the things hanging around the church. Um, when they go on the, on the ground, 
So Brendan walks along and a dog comes up to him and comes to heal in front of him. And this is a, a, an image of the fact that the dog forms before its master. Nature, um, you know, the animals of this place, greet the saint because the saint is known. Okay, because the dog always greets that of the person who knows. Okay. Remember all those Sherlock Holmes stories about the dog didn't bark and everything. You know, the point about dogs is they, they respond to people they know. They follow the dog to this place and there's water for washing the feet and there's food served. And then Brendan tells a story about, uh, tells us this, this uh, thing about how he says, well, the monks are going to look at these things hanging on the walls and attempt to steal them. And he says, do not touch it. And then there is a parable which I won't go into, but is largely taken out of the life of St. Anthony about the devil being inherited in the chest and driven out because of the part of the story. But I will say, we see here quite a strong theological motif, very common one, John Sosten, the idea that the dog forms upon somebody who knows. Uh, the dog uses a metaphor for the lion's behaviour of Daniel in the uh, Jewish city of Africa. Islands, generally are marked out as a place. In these islands, the animals know who Brendan is, and they behave towards him, they show signs of his importance. Also, in reference to uh, Tobit 11.9, uh, where a dog, which, interesting, as we'll see in a moment, it helped uh, Tobias in his struggles with a giant fish, and the giant fish came, uh, then forms on uh, uh, in the father's house. So these are, these are strong images then from scriptural and Subscriptural traditions, but also the natural imagery, just the dog greeting uh, Brendan. But also, if you're interested in your contemporary literature, it's the scene of Beemore's Hall in the Hobbit as well, if you are interested in talking about Brendan's text. Now, uh, oh, that was out of order, so I'll skip to what I told you now. Okay, now just after this, okay, and this is appropriate for the time of year we are at. This is the last stop they have before Easter, before the uh, Easter uh, celebration. And one of the things about this tale is very important is that their journeys around the island and the islands and the ocean and the, the natural, natural things they see there are tied up with a strong Easter motif. Okay? The next place they go to after visiting this house, and where this uh, episode of temptation, the temptation, of course, in terms of biblical literature, gets them to scene before Easter. Uh, they see an island not far from them. They steer towards this island. When they get out, they find that the island is called an enormous sheep. Okay. These enormous sheep represent something very significant in this tale, as we'll see. They're a good way in which a natural image is used both to convey something real, but also to convey a couple of theological ideas. Now, first of all, the sheep are there very conveniently because they need a sheep for Easter. And uh, Brendan says, you know, take a spotless lamb from the flock. And also a bit of a And after they have done all of this and collected what they need for Easter, a man comes along, a steward who lives on this island, and Brendan gave him some food, gave him some bread. And Brendan says to the man, why are the sheep so big? Because they're really big, they're bigger than cattle. And the man says, well, no one takes milk from the sheep on this island, nor does milk put any strain on them. They stay in the pastures always day and night, which is a bit of a hint as to maybe something, you know, something of the apocalypse here. And there. In consequence, they are larger here than the parts you come from. There are any farmers here, you know, but they don't want the sheep there as big as a room. I don't, know, but I don't think so. But of course, there's a there's a biblical reference here. It took me a while to notice that it's some of the earth in this month of winter. There's one of the real things. Who will keep a flock that not take it? It's rewards. So, in a way, in the perfect environment here, the steward who is living on this island is living here the perfect life. He's not taking the rewards of his labour by Paul, he's not taking the rewards of his labour. So the sheep become a metaphor for a biblical phrase. And they're also obviously there when they live there. It's probably a classical reference as well. I'm sure there's some efforts there near or to you know, home here, but uh, mainly it's a Sheep are a symbol of secular life. They're a symbol of pastoral community. And sheep are a favoured image for this in Irish literature. Uh, and what we see here is, I think, an apocalyptic motif. We're living in a place near to the last days, physically. We're travelling in time, as we see. And these sheep uh, are then wandering without anyone there because those who have been there have gone. 
and you can reconstruct this motif in a moment. I'll digress for a moment, go back to the life of St. Columba to tell you the story about sheep, because sheep are important to think of pastoral metaphor. But also, if you go out into these northern islands, as I have, there's an awful lot of sheep out there. You go onto these islands in the ocean, the Faroe Islands, Kilda, the Orkney Islands, Shetlands, they're kind of sheep, and they're old sheep. They've been known as you know, genetically old sheep. Any attempt to bring a European sheep now and you know, introduce the population until the other sheep die, they're, you know, they're not part of the same gene pool anymore, really, and they're not they've got resistance to diseases. They're funny because there's a lot of fluffy balls of cotton wool with a stick coming out of the bottom, you know, like goats. You know. But anyway, on these islands, there's a story about sheep. One time, a man called Bad Orman, by race and descent of the near to all, when setting out with others to seek again a deserter in Oceano, a heroine in Oceano, both phrases are used, asked the saint's blessing. The saint bidding him adieu uttered in this prophecy regarding him The man who is going in search of a desert in the ocean shall not be buried in the desert, but in that place where a woman shall dry sheep over his grave. The saint had worn out the long wanderings and stormy seas, returned to his native country without finding the required desert, and remained for many years the head of a small monastic house. And when after all he was died and buried in Derry, it happened at the same time he encountered some hostile inroads, some raiders coming in, there's no writings, so The poor people with their wives and children fled for sanctuary to the church of that place. I understand the sort of monastery you're talking about here. It's probably like a little enclosure. And there'll be an outer bit where you're allowed to go if you're a visitor. And there'll be an inner bit where only men go, and occasionally monks go, and only occasionally a patron or so may go in there as well. You know, it's a very close place. Okay, it's the, you know, it's the enclosure. But it occurred on a certain day, a woman was caught as she was driving her lambs over the grave of the same man who was newly buried. And a holy priest was present says, Now this will be the property sent to our road many years ago. And this I myself was told, he says, to that I mean, by the priest and soldier of Christ. In the desert, fathers is a lot of imagery like this. The man mentions up and says, Father, you know, I have disrupted your, broken your rule, I have made you depart from your normal rule. And the father says, Yes, my normal rule is solitude, but it is my pleasure to give you hospitality and send you on your way. It's a favourite motif because, of course, it's that thing about being a We'd love to have nature all to ourselves, space all to ourselves, silence. There's always some pesky person who wants our help. Okay. And that, of course, is a very important humility motif. They all wants to find solitude in the ocean. He wants to just be alone with the birds and the sheep and all the people out there. But he can't. The sheep here are a metaphor, actually. The way there are sheep, there are women, there is domesticity. Sheep are a domesticated beast. And therefore, she gets into the enclosure and drives the sheep across the grave. Not good for that at all. He finds that humiliating. But good for him as well, because of course, it is better to be hospitable than to be alone. Okay, that's challenging being a Christian in a nutshell, really, isn't it? Everything was also the most broken thing you don't want to do. Really. So the monk seeks solitude, required to attend to these elves, which sheep are used to make this motif. Now, the place where the sheep live in is the Royal St. Brendan now, in this island of sheep. This is really interesting. Over the channel from this place is another island, and it's separated by a very small strait of water. And on the other one, there is a tree of extraordinary girth, and no less height, covered in white birds, covering it so much that one could scarcely see its leaves or branches. But I have no time to tell you about this tree in all its glory. But these birds are actually uh, an incarnation of the souls of angels who were caught up in the fall were not complicit, they were innocent bystanders that sort of went along. They were neither condemned to hell nor were uh, they given a simple free pass. They live in an interim state, they are suspended until the last days. In Western, you know, the mysticism is full of these characters, people who live in the interim state. You don't know what to do with them, they're waiting for the last days. They will be judged for the last days, many of them will probably be judged you know, fairly, but uh, you know, positively, but they are waiting. But they get respite, it's a sort of sanitarian motif. They get respite on the seventh day and they get to turn into birds. If that's an improvement, I mean, I don't know what the reason is, is that better than living just in 
what it sold, and I'm not in a position to answer that one. And I, when they get embodied, they, they sing a bird song, and that bird song is actually the monastic office. I love that. So in the perfect desert, the music of birds will be the Psalms. That really suits me as an idea. And uh, there's a whole lot of interesting theological ideas about that, but probably too many to go through that. There's also very interesting questions about birds and prophecy. If you know uh, uh, the uh, theology of origin, for example, the discussion, the problem about you know, the incarnation and, and the birds and birds to prophet, the humans and stuff there, but not really enough time to talk about that. But there's a context to this because you see, these birds and sheep also relate to real encounters. And what I want to suggest here is that in these literary tales, there's also a sense of something very fundamental, and that is that this is people going out into the wilderness and being you know, mightily in awe of what they see there. And we must never lose sight of the fact that that awe is a large part of the theology of these texts. This is one of the places they went. This is the islands of sheep and birds. I don't get the colours quite so well here, but it's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see. It's these gigantic islands poking out of the um, ocean, the Faroe Islands. And these tiny straits between them, and full of birds, birds everywhere in this place. And here we know historically from an Irish writer who ended up at the court of Charlemagne, Charlemagne's son, actually, on the continent around about 790 ish. He said, This is a set of islands that were discovered by the Irish nearly 100 years ago, he says, right in 825, so that's 730 AD. The Vikings had driven out his the Irish had lived there. Until then, they had lived there for about 100 years. And when they left, they left the islands deserted, and now the they are filled with these countless sheep and many diverse kinds of seabirds. So the author of our Navigatio Santa Grandani has taken this historical story about people living in the islands and become deserted, and now only contain sheep and birds. And he's turned it into this very rich narrative about the Easter ritual spread across the island and the things that go on around it. But behind it is a core story. And I suppose it's a very interesting story because these are people who went out to find solitude. They went out to find the vacant spaces and live in them. And yet they were discovered. I mean, these islands were really deserted for centuries. You know, they possibly don't ever live in the Federal Islands before the Irish went there. And yet within a century, they were disturbed by the Scandinavians, who were not Christian, who drove them out with violence. I mean, in other words, these are people who in the early church context had gone to contemplate the outer rim of the world in the belief that the end of the world was soon. And indeed, they felt by taking their faith to these islands in the ocean, they were also perhaps taking the gospel to the last nations. In Matthew 24, the world would end after the gospel was coming to the last nations. They believed that. That was part of their narrative, part of their theology, if you like. And of course, you know, they wished too hard, and in a way, the apocalypse happened, but it was a different apocalypse to the one they were anticipating. It must have been a shock to think you were alone with nature, and something like these guys turned out. So we thought very very accurate living on these islands there in the ocean, the like Faroe Islands. So this is an encounter with the wildest part of the world, making its way back into these narratives, these signs and signals. In between the two islands, there's a famous scene where each of the priests sits down to sing his mass, liturgically a very interesting historical thing. This is the earliest reference that I know of, of priests saying their mass individually. Uh, so it's very interesting that. And Brendan's sitting in the boat saying, he's all the other brothers climb up onto this island which lies in the strait between the two big islands. And the flesh they had brought from the other island, when they'd done this, they put a pot on the fire. And they're plying the fire with wood and the pop against the boil. Then the island starts to go like this. And the brothers rush to the boat, crying out protection to the Holy Fathers, and he calls them all in. They, they see them. The island moves off, and the light of fire on its back carries on burning. And he says, Brothers, you'd surprise at what's on that. I don't think Brendan's very smug here. He's sort of saying, I know what it is, you know, but I'm not going to tell you. And they all go up there and have this terrible experience. And he says, You're surprised what the was done. I said, Yes, we're very surprised. He said, My son, do not be afraid. God will deal to me during the night and vision the secret of this. When we were on that thing, it was not an island, but a fish. The 
foremost of all that swim in the ocean. He's always trying to bring his tail to his head. He cannot because of his length. His name is Yastonius. Yastonius is a, uh, it's a macaronic form, as you call it. It's an Irish word for fish, yes, with this um, Latin terminal. The best translation I can think of is sort of a fishy one. Mr. Fishy really is a big, big fish, fishable fish. In the and this is an image, well, if you know your uh, Greek literature, there's a Greek novel by Longus, so I think it is, and has a little land on the back of the fish. You know, it's quite a, an ancient motif. But it's used to you because, of course, these people would count a joint fish in the ocean. And I won't mention nothing in the text here informally, but I would like to give you pictures of papyrus. But the other things that come across in this tale is a great big crystal pillar coming out. As well, which is a sign of an iceberg, I would have thought. Kind of fairly south as well, um, in terms of these people sort of went to all these places. Matthew 12, 40, Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, well, so in the sun and man three days and three nights on the earth. It's Easter. It's Easter. Like Jonah in the belly of the fish, Christ descends. But of course, as it is Easter and Easter has happened, and Christ has risen, the fish does not dive down because, of course, nature is now telling us that Christ has triumphed. So um, the fact that the beast goes on sailing along doesn't die a single bit. Forms of Easter vigil are back with associated with the underworld, doesn't dive down, seeing that Christ to a time of death. Cooking a meat on the back of the fish, this is a really good Easter time. Dietary obsessions here, I think. But one really key thing the, the, the Celtic churches, compared to the other Western churches, have a problem with the early ages and they were three years, which is they couldn't agree on the day of Easter. We all know that problem. We couldn't agree on that problem. That's pretty much the day of Easter. And what, of course, the fish is doing is the fish appears on Saturday at Easter, and the fish knows when that Easter is. We can't believe it, but it knows. Nature is liturgically correct. You know, nature knows what we are imperfect in the So nature partly reflects the perfection of God's creation and is a signifier to the right things in that creation. And let's face it, big fish, Jonah imagery, awful lot of that flowing around in the scriptures as well as there is. On another occasion, they're out in the ocean, the beast of immense size follows in the distance. He spout foam from his nostrils and plowed through the waves of the great thieves, if you were about to now them. Um, the Irish scholar who tried to recreate the voice and breath and said, yeah, it's killed the whale, it's killed the whale. I don't know, I always sort of think the wire and all these things are floating around in there as well. You know, that tell us literally. Deliver us, lords, and the beast does not devour us, they say. Raymond says, don't be afraid, don't be faith. God will always defend us or deliver us from the mouth of the beast and from other dangers. The venerable elder raised his hand to heaven and said, Lord, deliver your servants as you delivered David from the hand of the lion, the giant, as you delivered Jonah from the belly of the whale. And after these three pleas asked for deliverance, a mighty monster turned up from the west and was going to encounter the beast. It's like the end of Jurassic Park, you know, the great beast are wrestling and they're killing each other over the watches. He immediately attacked him, emitting fire from his mouth. The elder spoke to his brothers when he had said that did this to the richer beast and pursued the deserts of Christ was cut into three pieces before the rise. Three pleas, three big pieces. The other returned after his victory when he had come, and another day they saw the distance of a very large island full of trees. While they were drawing in the shore and disembarking the boat, they saw the end portion of the beast that had been slain. Friend said, Seek what was wished to devour you, now you shall devour it. You will stay a long while on this island and take the boat out of the water and look for water, etc. A couple of interesting things there. First of all, we go back to uh, dietary descriptions. What point about the monastic dietary descriptions, echoing, um, echoing some of the early books of scripture, uh, not to be carried. Okay? This is being washed up. But it's much of what's going on in this wilderness as these brothers are living in this natural place is that these sort of diet prescriptions seem to disappear. But secondly, also really importantly, as the last days approach us, one of the traditions of uh, this epigraphic, 
is the idea of this thing called the Nissanic Feast, where the people feast upon the Viath, and, and this is a, a well known you know, uh, uh, sort of scriptural tradition. So these images, these animals, these large beasts of the sea are drawn out to be symbolisms uh, of uh, apocalyptic things. So in conclusion then, I suppose I'm just looking at these things, we have a whole lot of different discourses going on here. We have nature provides things for the travellers, and across the Easter uh, ritual we have the journey from one island to the other, the island of the sheep, onto the back of the fish, and then on Easter Sunday, the land in the, uh, in the uh, island of birds. Uh, and the way in which different types of flesh are juxtaposed here, the way they are prepared at particular moments, there's a strong commentary on, on Lent and dietary restrictions going on. They're all tied up in this imagery of nature that is, seems to be just the things you find in the ocean. But also there's, in these things, a little bit more going on. In the journey between these islands, you're also travelling in a metaphorical way, Birds and fishes are made on the boat on the day before the beasts. Genesis 1 21, we're told God created the great sea beasts and every living, living creature, and then the waters brought forth according to their kinds. These people, the Easter ritual, are travelling backwards through that narrative. They're going to the fish and then to the birds. So there's all sorts of odd meta narratives and implicit narratives here. Finally, an awful lot about apocalyptic in the ocean, people travelling in the ocean, being people encountering nature, encountering the wilderness, encountering these symbolic beasts in the ocean, and doing so very much in a narrative of end time. And what happens to Brendan and his followers in their journey through the ocean is like they've stepped outside of our time and they are in an initiation journey to go to the promised land and have a vision of the last days. Now, look at the story, just a couple of minutes clear now. What it is, is there's a tradition in Ireland, then, and there's other texts that talk about this as well, that if you leave the coast of Ireland and go into the ocean and see these islands in the ocean, some of these are places where the monks want to go and live and contemplate nature. But surrounding them are the signs that people see not only at the end of the world, but at the end of time. And so these monastic fathers are seeing themselves both in a cyclic narrative, a narrative of time passing, contemplating the wilderness, but just as the liturgy is both a symmetrical cycle and a progression through the life events of Christ, and those having been a, a beginning and an end as opposed to the cycle of nature of day and liturgy. The ocean is both a place in which you may live in contemplation of nature, but nature is perpetually telling you also of the echoing of things to come, the giant beasts, the apocalyptic symbols, all these things, natural things they encounter are pulled towards the apocalyptic symbols. And in this ocean then, uh, there's an experimentation. The monks travel in the ocean. When they travel out to the promised land, they go for seven years around the ocean, always visiting the same places at the age of feasts until they are allowed to go to the promised land. So it becomes a metaphor for life. They're not on a straight line. They're on a cyclical journey. And like that tension between the symmetrical cycle and the life cycle, that are given the beginning and an end, that comes after much travelling around. And in their travelling around, the nature or natural world reflects the requirements of their liturgical performance. And at least we have this complex narrative of the lands and beasts. But it's all tied up, I think, with an apocalyptic vision. The monasticism pursued in this environment both contemplates a continuity of nature, but also the idea that nature is part of God's narrative towards the end. And this is a good example, just to conclude with. This is a story I found in a Latin text, The Life of a Saint. Uh, from Ireland, Munu. Munu is a funny sort of name. Uh, his real name is Finton, I love to say, typically the monastic name, because no resemblance. It's, it's created by putting an affectionate name on the beginning, a mo name, or my. Because my Finton becomes Minton in a way. And then you put another a diminutive suffix on the end, it becomes Munu. 
um, so it's like sort of my thinking of into the universe, it's sort of very, very sort of peculiar, sort of affection of names it's called. So Nuru of the Tarmans, as James called, he also went to the promised land. And he gives this wonderful narrative about going to the promised land. He goes, he says, you go to Shli Lee, this great headland in the west of Ireland, a, a holy mountain, a holy mountain, a holy tree of Zion. Accordingly, he says, it comes upon you an unbearable emergency. These are the last days. We're in an emergency situation. Go to the mountain stones in the region of the Lagani, to the gathering place that extends into the sea. And there you should sail while killing your cattle. And you're allowed to eat the meat of the cattle. Indeed, on account of the speed of your departure, you may not be otherwise able to make provision for yourselves. And then use the skins of your cows to sail successfully to the holy land of promise. And I'm thinking, wow, here. But the idea is in the way here that it's saying that we live with animals and with the natural world and with the ocean in a story. And that story is about, on the one hand, the things we are allowed to do and the things we are not allowed to do and the control we have over ourselves in our diet, the ways in which we do things. Uh, theologically, liturgically. But there is also going to be a moment when you just got to get there. You know, when all the rules go out the window, you know, and you may travel in the skins of your cows because that's how you will get there. So there's an apocalyptic thing, you may eat the meat whatever day of the week it is, and you may cook it wherever you want, you know, bronze vessels with you and cook the meat. That gives you a, a hint of things that the rules go out the window. But in all of this narrative then there is this idea we go into this ocean, this ocean is a really awesome place. It's full of these really weird things, giant fish, you know, really big fish, icebergs, islands that are just full of birds, islands where no one has ever been. The Faroe Islands, they say, these islands have been deserted since the beginning of time, and now they are deserted again, says Dick Will. When Brendan goes there, there's nothing but sheep. Deserted since the beginning of time, and deserted again. The perfect desert will be somewhere where no one has been. And when it is deserted, that's a narrative of loss. It's an idea that nature has come back and humans are gone. You know, and that will happen one day. What can I say in conclusion then? Okay, these guys went out there and they had a very vivid imagination. They encountered nature, they found the outer world, the wild world, and in that wild world, stories. They found animals that pointed them to things, pointed them to signifiers. They were brought into liturgical stories. The saints could find animals in a place to let them prove their power over nature, to demonstrate God's power, to show other people, to show the unconverted and the weaker of belief. It's a testing place like the desert. The ocean becomes like the desert in the Egyptian tradition. It becomes a place a liminal place to go into, you come out again, if you can. Poor man gets back by the skin of his teeth. When you are there, there are things that will test you. There are creatures that are there that will test you. These things become both diabolical, uh, resources to be consumed, signs to good things as well. Perhaps you don't have that encounter with nature anymore. You know, we don't have that opportunity to go into places where nobody lives, no one has ever been. We can't go out and find that. But I think still, in the end, what these tales tell you is that's what we should search for. We should look for the places that remind us of the awesomeness of nature and how nature, in a way, allows us to see things, to contemplate things, to find those narratives, to find our own discoveries in ways that we can't in the settled world. They become our liminal places where we venture and we find these things that uh, are moments of uh, internal, finding our internal spirituality using those external signs. Um, this tale, The Voyage of St. Brendan, became probably Western Europe's most popular tale about monasticism in the Middle Ages. It became a narrative that inspired people, secular people, as well as, um, as, well as uh, religious people. Obviously, it has that great appeal, sort of like Star Trek or something like that. Every day we go to a new planet, we find something new. 
but also it's a metaphor for our desire in life, to quote St. Augustine, that we are all pilgrims on the earth in the way that we seek on travelling. And I think that's the appeal the table always had. But also much of its appeal was the fact that at every turn there was something weird coming out of the forest or out of the ocean or there. And of course, people find in those stories all the levels of meaning. The meaning is the simple encounter with uh, the awesomeness of nature. But also the ways in which these things are signs to our narratives. Narratives that we recognise in one way or the other. Anyway, not really a presentation about uh, what we can do to save the planet in the present day, but still something of an insight into how people in the age of the saints saw the world around them, saw things in the world around them, and found meaning in travelling.